coming home to your tender suit. Oh, baby, you're my one and only one. Hello, everybody. I, I have the distinct pleasure to get you all when you're amidst food coma. So hopefully this will be a high energy session where you'll be just, you know, launching yourselves out of your seats with excitement. Um, but thank you, Eric, and, and the Capacity Interactive team. It is wonderful to be back here at this year's boot camp. So I'm Luke Rotohorst from Google, and I was really impressed with all the new hands when Eric asked yesterday how many people are, are new to boot camp. There's so many people here that I knew people here that I thought I should give a little bit of background uh, on myself before really getting into the bulk of the research, which I'm super excited to share. So um, how many of you are familiar with this concept or, or, or this type of performance called a tableau vivant? Just by a show of hands here. Okay, great. Yeah, so the, the official definition of a tableau vivant is a silent, motionless group of people arranged to represent a scene or incident, usually from a work of art. So this is a Surat painting, right, a Sunday afternoon. You have the various people who are joining together to stage this work of art. My family, every New Year's Eve, we, we, we perform stage, we'll call it, our own tableau vivant. Um, it, 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 it goes down kind of like this. We drink a whole bunch of champagne, um, very unoriginal for New Year's Eve. Uh, but what happens after that is we go scrambling throughout the house looking for cardboard, tin foil, duct tape, um, anything to assemble these really makeshift costumes that somehow reflect the theme of the Tableau Vivant, which we will have voted on earlier that morning. Um, so there is no um, you know, professional lighting. We have no you know, fancy costume designers or anything. So whatever perception you have in your mind of what our Tableau Vivant looks like, like lower it about 10x, and then maybe you might get close. But to, 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 to give the big reveal, this is actually what this past year's looked like. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, so like I said, each one has a particular theme. And this past year's theme were the invented phrases of William Shakespeare. So remember the, the Seattle Shakespeare <laughs> film we saw yesterday with all the athletes in Seattle? Uh, so Seattle, Seattle Shakespeare, if you're, if, you're, if you're out there, my family's available. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, we, we can do this. Um, we'll, we'll only charge champagne, that's, that's all. Um, but, but to give you a sense of like, what, so there I am in the back, uh, that actually says that's Greek to me in Greek from, from Julius Caesar. Um, my wife, her name is Lily, so she's a gilded lily. Um, a murder most foul, of course, obviously. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it's totally obvious what's going on here, right? It's like, you, 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 I didn't have to tell you this were the invented phrases of Shakespeare, you just got it, right? Um, so, uh, I want to focus on, on, on one particular member here, so my son. Um, so, yeah, Eric, Eric gave the nice precursor last year where I, I basically just showed a bunch of baby pictures, right? <laughs> because my son had just been born a month before boot camp last year, and so, and I just, it was my week back from paternity leave. So he's 13 months now. Good news for all of you, it means I'm much more rested. Um, yeah, uh, but yeah, so, so, so uh, his starring role, uh, or, or his premiere role was a pickle, yeah? From, in a pickle, and it actually comes from the Tempest, right? And so you have King Alonzo who says, and Trinculo is reeling ripe, where, they should, where should they find this grand liquor that hath gilded him? How camest thou in this pickle? To which Trinculo the clown says, I have been in such a pickle since I saw you la la last that. I fear me will never out of my bones. I shall not fear fly blowing. So, one thing to point out here is, you know, my son, obviously, starring as the pickle here. But two, don't you think there was sort of a missed opportunity in culture to not have picked up on the slogan, I shall not fear fly blowing? <laughs> like, w w we got in a pickle from this, but fly blowing is, I feel like, an untapped opportunity. <laughs> um, so, uh, I suppose I should actually give you a little bit of background about what I do in my work at Google. So um, I've been at Google for over nine years now. I'm in our Ann Arbor, Michigan office. So a little shout out here to, yes, there you go, UMS people, I'm guessing, maybe, yes? Yeah, awesome, love UMS. Um, so I work on the ticketing and live events team at Google. And so the broader team, we work um, from folks ranging to all the sports leagues, to ticket 
uh, Ticketmaster Live Nation, uh, to my particular focus, which is on Broadway and the performing arts. So I work very closely with the capacity team, um, and, and, so, and I'm so excited to be a part of this broader community. Um, so, uh, and, and also, by the way, uh, the Tableau theme for this year hasn't been determined yet. <laughs> So maybe during Q&A, you could just shout out some, <laughs> some opportunities. Um, but I want to actually get into the, the research a little bit here now, too. And so I want to start by, by setting the methodology uh, for, for how this research came about. So we started by asking, surveying people and qualifying people if they were likely to buy a ticket to a live event like one of, our, uh, like one of the performances that we put on in the next three months. So that's how we qualified the audience of people uh, that we are surveying here. And by agreeing to be a part of the survey, they downloaded an app on their devices, which allowed us to see whenever they were engaging with an, a performance or an event or a concert, we'd be able to see when they were directly engaged with that type of content or that type of um, information on their, on their various devices. And so uh, when they landed on one of those pages or one of those apps, uh, they then got another trigger survey that asked deeper questions. And so what this research is doing is going across that whole path. So you have this qualified audience of people who were likely to buy a ticket to uh, a performance, tracked when they were engaged with our event type uh, content and material, and then ask them deeper questions at that point once that trigger was, was announced. So this happened over a, a month time period. A little over 1,000 people were surveyed here. Um, so uh, what I really like about the, the theme of boot camp, camp this year is it's, it's arts, hearts, and data minds. I mean, it's emblazoned on all of the, the bags we have, right? Um, so the research that I'm going to get to is really about the data minds. But I really want to start with the, the arts hearts first. Um, and the next stats, they actually aren't from our research, but I think it's a really good thing to orient us around for the rest of my presentation. So this is from a McCann study of 2,000 people. 93% of these people uh, said that entertainment is vital to their happiness, right? 92% think of entertainment as a fundamental human need. This is our business, right? This is like the tip of Maslow's pyramid of human needs, and that's what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, which is an incredible thing. The entertainment that we are providing is driving joy in our patrons, in their lives. We're not selling shoes. You know, we're not selling toothpaste. We're literally giving an experience that is driving and kindling joy in people's lives. And what's even incredible from this research here, too, is attending a music concert, attending a live show or performance, visiting a museum, the top five results in this survey are basically represented by folks in this audience here too. Right? Three of the top five could be represented to the exact type of culture and entertainment that we are driving. People want to be entertained. It's a source of joy. We are the providers of the entertainment that is top for them. It's incredible. It's an incredible opportunity we have. But people aren't feeling entertained, right? Only 44% 44 of people say they rarely feel entertained these days. Like, this is our job as an industry, right? So when I get into all the research, this really matters, right? We need to get more people entertained by the stories that we're telling, by the shows that we're putting on, the concerts we're performing, right? It's all there. The raw material is there. I think we should feel empowered as an industry to be there for our patrons when they so desperately want us. So what really ties this together, and is pretty incredible too, is this is steeping into the research a little bit here now, is that the business opportunity for us is immense. So for example, the, the research here broke down, uh, we were able to determine three different groups. There are frequent ticket buyers, moderate ticket buyers, and casual ticket buyers. So casual ticket buyers were people who go attend and buy tickets for one to three, who have determined, them, determined themselves in the survey as one to three, attend one to three live events in a year, performances uh, like we put on. If we were just to t get those casual ticket purchasers to go to one more show, 
So they're already going to shows. If we could get them to go to one more show, that all of a sudden goes from a 2.6 billion revenue opportunity to a $4.4 billion revenue opportunity. That's a 70% increase by just getting this group of people to go to one more show. We're not talking about the mass market convincing someone completely new to come to our show. We're trying to get someone who is already going to our events or already going to events like us. Um, what's incredible too is that the, the stories that are engaging our audience are the same reason why people were going to see theater back, back in, you know, when the Greeks were putting on shows, right? It's that same spark of entertainment. It's the same reason why we go to the shows and why we participate in all the art that's represented here in the audience. What's different is the path and how they got there, right? And that's what our research is going to show. Um, Eric also mentioned this in the introduction, but, but I'm still obsessed with haikus. I try to write one every single day. I tweet them so you could, you could see them all there. Um, but whenever I'm trying to make a point in this particular presentation, you're going to get a haiku, right? <laughs> so here's your first one. Understand their path. Meet your fans where they spend time and entertain them. So now for the data, mind, data minds part of the presentation. Uh, we got the heart, now the mind. Um, so we're going to start by really focusing in on uh, the in-market casual fans. So those, the people who, are, again, are, have bought one to three tickets. Uh, given the huge opportunity to get them to come to one more event, I want to really dig in to give you some insight on who they are, what their behavior is based off of the, the surveys that we, uh, and the research that we ran. So first of all, um, they spend nearly a week longer in purchase consideration than the frequent ticket buyer. right? So uh, everybody laughed. I think it was when, when, when Eric said, how many people said, um, you know, you have your boss say just like, hey, the, the show's not selling well on Friday. Let's come up with a campaign now, you know, on Tuesday, right? That's like insane. Think about this. Like, if you're actually trying to get people in the door, like, if, if you have that two-day window, that's insane for even the frequent ticket purchasers. But if we're trying to get the casual fan, are your marketing strategies having that holistic perspective where we actually need a longer time frame to implement that marketing strategy to move them, to get them to come to that one more, one more event. So we also were able to track people who purchased these tickets. Um, so uh, that purchase behavior happened at, at one end, but we were also able to track all the activity that happened before that particular purchase, when they were involved on, uh, on platforms that were directly related to um, the performing arts and live events. So, for example, they visited ticketing sites, right? So these would be like the telecharges, uh, ticket masters uh, of the world. And it would make sense that this would spike at the end because where do you make the purchase on these, tic is on these ticketing sites, right? So, uh, and at the bottom on the axis here, this is 11 to 20, 6 to 10. Those are how many steps out from purchase. Right? So you have the purchase here. And so the, uh, you see this big spike at the end because it's on these ticketing sites where you actually are making that purchase. So that would make sense that you would get that spike at the end. Um, also looking at search. So search is happening consistently across the board here. Um, and again, these are only for terms that are directly related to events or tickets or anything that is going to be industry specific. Um, and it also makes sense that that would drop off at the end because the purchase doesn't happen on search, right? Search is trying to get you to wherever that purchase or wherever that interaction is, is taking you. YouTube as well. So these are people who are engaged directly in live event type content. Again, this isn't like cat videos. This is people who are, who are watching um, you know, previews of the music that you're about to see or, or uh, people talking about the performance that they, they just saw. So this is only that live event specific type content of, on YouTube that we're focused on here. Social, consistent presence again uh, across the board here. And again, this isn't just social overall. This is when people are visiting specific event pages or anything that is very specific to that uh, performing arts event. Um, Lastly, we have show sites here, and this is like this is what we've been talking about. This is what Aubrey talked about. This is what Nick talked about in the previous session. These are your actual websites, right? So this is the significant role that your site actually plays uh, throughout this process 
uh, throughout the process as well. Um, and then lastly, there's news and info sites. And you could think of these as uh, people who are reading reviews, um, people reading news articles, um, uh, people are engaging with you uh, outside of your own uh, outside of your own site experience. So all of this, it, it, all of this, at, like at each of these points, and at each point in the graph, it adds up to 100%, right? So it's like of the people who were surveyed in the, at, at the very end, right before purchase, so that peak at the, high, at the very high there for ticketing sites, with all those other uh, like show sites, social, uh, YouTube search, that all adds up to 100% along the way. So I, you're probably looking at this and you're just like, great, you're telling me you have to be everywhere at all times, right? People are, there's no consistent path here. Like it's insane to like pull out patterns here, but it's just like, actually that's not the case. If we were to focus in on the casual ticket purchaser, um, some patterns start to emerge. And here's one that I think is even more salient given Aubrey's talk yesterday. Casual fans spent 3.7 times spend more time per person with branded sites each month, so these are your show and performance sites, than the frequent fan, right? And that kind of makes sense given, given Aubrey's approach too. It's like, you know, she wasn't interviewing the people who are the season subscribers. We we're trying to bring in the, pers uh, the perspective of folks who you weren't already going to get. And those folks are completely reliant on your website, more so than everybody else. So given all the massive steps that people are taking, if we're trying to really engage that casual fan to get them to go to one more event, optimizing your website and figuring out how we can get them in that flywheel on your website is an essential step. The other thing, and Eric did a really great job of emphasizing this yesterday, is like placement doesn't matter anymore. Right? It's all about behavior. And at Google, we have seven properties with over a billion users each. Right? And so you're able to now, you're not just someone who, who exists on YouTube and then exists in a silo over on Gmail, exists on search. Like All of it is a part of the same online experience. So it's not about targeting just YouTube or targeting just search or just, just display. It's about targeting the audience that's actually going to be relevant for you. And so the way that you could use all these insights across platform um, can look uh, uh, like a couple things on, on Google. So you have in, people who are in market for live events. So we literally know, if, based off of people's uh, search behavior, their, their, uh, where they're visiting the web, like are they actually in market to buy a ticket? You can target those people who exhibit that behavior where they're actually in market to purchase a ticket. You could target theater aficionados, for example, people whose behavior is suggesting that they are leaned in for exactly what you're interested in, right? You're not targeting a news site. You're targeting a news site when a theater aficionado is on that news site, right? And then lastly, there's custom intent audiences where you can pick and choose whatever insights are gonna be most valuable for you and your patrons to, uh, uh, to figure out what's that sort of custom profile that you wanna create and target uh, across, uh, across the ecosystem as well. So I can't emphasize this enough, and Eric did a really, again, did a really elegant job. Like, placement targeting is, it's way past, <laughs> given, given the power that you have when it comes to audience and using all these intent, intent signals across platform. Don't pigeonhole your yourself in something when you can really be doing something much more, uh, much more cohesive and cheaper, as Eric pointed out. Um, here you go, you got a haiku. Oh. <laughs> Casual fans spend more time researching and considering, oh, that's one line, uh, meet them where they are. Um, so uh, use intent signals to drive consideration. Uh, this is another thing I wanted to talk about, and, and, and really the way I think about these folks is, uh, going to the next slide, we have ticket purchasers and ticket considerers. These ticket considerers, they're like the hamlets of, of the ticketing space, right? They're constantly, they're like, oh, what do I do? Do I go to this show? Do I go to that show? They're like, do I, do I, do I, do I go to that? You, you know, and so they're constantly thinking and pining over like which show or thing to go to given all the myriad options of, of, of entertainment that we provide. Um, 
how do we get them out of there? How do we spark them to action, right? How do we get these ticket considerers to actually get into the purchase part of uh, get into the purchase part of our flat, flywheel cycle? So, for example, uh, and this is looking at search in particular. So, uh, people from the, who are surveyed here who actually bought a ticket. Um, 76% of the time they were searching for artists, show reviews, performances, performance dates, so more general type terms. 24% of the time their search behavior was suggesting that they were a little bit further down that purchase consideration because they're searching for more ticket terms. Not only were they searching for the category, but they were actually looking for tickets in that particular category, which is 2x more than these considerers. So from a strategic standpoint, what are we doing for these considerers who want to go to our events, but they just haven't pulled the trigger yet, right? How are we thinking about the, the non-brand search experience? Or are we so focused on what's happening here, right on the conversion point of the cycle, and not as much in that consideration phase? So that's something that I would, um, something that I definitely consider. Are we thinking holistically uh, about, our, uh, about our, our, our fans and patrons. Um, arts and theater considerers are also more, li more likely to be average fans, which I thought was interesting. So this is one of the questions that we asked, or just like on a scale of one to five, are you a super fan or like not a fan at, at all? For these you know, casual fans, and who are in this more in this consideration set, they're average fans, right? So it's gonna take them more to actually buy that ticket. Right? It might take that friend who's taking them, um, taking them along with them. It might take some sort of um, other external stimulus to get there because they're not that like, super fan who's going to be going to everything. Um, they're also more likely to be planning a family outing, which I thought was, was interesting too. Because if you think about, you know, if you have a family, like time is different. Like, believe me, my last 13 months have been completely different than any other time in my life with my son now. Right? So it's, uh, if you're, if you're, if you have this as a consideration factor, how are you planning for that, right? Is there a way that you could be communicating or framing things in a way uh, for, for this unique need uh, of this audience? Um, so I actually want to give you some examples of what are some of the uh, consideration type tactics that folks in the entertainment space are using on Google um, to really try to use intent beyond search to get people um, further down the funnel or, or into that uh, flywheel cycle. So um, this is a tactic called um, True View for Action. So this is a pre-roll ad that uh, shows on YouTube. And in the past, you just were able to show you know, 15 or 30 second spot with the, you know, after five seconds you can skip and it was more about that sort of interaction that was it, that was just the interaction. But Truvy for Action, they are now baking in, we are now the ability to actually collect leads or take some sort of direct response from that type of targeting. So if we actually roll the video here, this is an example of what that experience looks like. So you're watching your video. Accept the mission, um, accept your mission to, you know, uh, for a Mission Impossible here. You enter your email, and now Paramount Pictures has your email, right? Because you've accepted the mission, uh, and this was three three months out, three months out from the premiere. So the, what what that's interesting from the the movie studio perspective is like every they, they, you are in a much better position than any movie studio because you actually have subscribers, you have people who constantly come to your venues. Mission Impossible 6, yeah, there are five other movies before them, but they have no data of who those people are, right? So they're literally like trying to figure out from the outset, trying to get as much data as possible to build consideration based on as much intent as, much intent as they have. You're way in a way better position than Paramount Studios here, like way better position. Um, but I do think it's interesting here that they are leaning into video for something that they were previously relying just on search for, right? They now have the ability to get some direct response out of this, uh, out of this video platform. And from a performance standpoint, um, performed at 2x uh, above their baseline metric, 
for brand lift. So people who saw this ad in comparison to people who didn't um, performed much better from uh, a consideration and ad recall perspective. So that's how they were also measuring success in addition to all the emails that they were able to, to generate. Um, I think it's also interesting, too, what they did next. So this is also a Mission Impossible example, but uh, the previous example was what they did three months out from Premiere. Two weeks out from the Premiere, they used uh, this targeting tactic called custom intent. So where they were able to use these more undecided moviegoer type terms, upcoming movies, new movies 2018, action movies, blockbuster films, anybody who was searching on those particular queries when they would go to YouTube, they were get, then getting an ad based off of those queries that were showing some sort of intent for going to, going to the movies. And this is another True View for Action ad here. They weren't asking for an email. They're asking you to actually buy tickets, right? So they weren't asking people to buy tickets three months in advance. They were just asking for emails. But as they got closer to the premiere, that's when they were actually getting people to ask for tickets, um, and they were basing how they were serving these ads off of search behavior, right? So I'm using an example from the movie studios here, when you're just like, oh great, yeah, Paramount has like eight gajillion dollars, like we're never gonna have budgets like that. I could have showed examples here from Broadway and the Performing Arts, but what I, I really like about this example is that it shows the like flywheel cycle, right? They went from lead gen then to actual conversion, right? It was a part of a cohesive strategy. It wasn't just a one-off campaign here and there. This is, True View for Action is something that we're definitely seeing pick up steam um, in, the, in the Broadway space particular, and by extension, uh, more on the performing arts. And from a performance perspective, it's had 30% higher conversion volume at a 20% lower CPA, right? So CPA, conversion volume, that like language didn't exist on YouTube before. It is now becoming more of a performance platform because of all of the intent signals that we're able to take into account here. In-market fans find direct response beyond search with intent signals. So um, in the last section here, I'm so excited to talk to this, uh, this group about this, and, and because storytelling has been such a theme throughout all of, of boot camp this year, um, if there's one thing that really stood out in the research, it was that the impact of video was really significant for arts and theater purchasers in particular. So 56% of arts and theater purchasers who watched that type of content said it helped them get excited to attend an event. That's in comparison to 48% of other live event ticket purchasers who said the same. So video is more impactful for people who are in the arts and theater space than it is for folks who are going to you know, sporting events or, or uh, uh, um, something, another live event like that, right? And it's not just on that getting excited to attend. 47% said it helped them get started thinking about a ticket purchase, right? We're starting to get into the flywheel here in comparison to 41% of other live event ticket purchasers. 44% said so it helped them decide to buy tickets versus 39% of other live events. And, then, and I was thinking, just like, like how, why could this be? And I thought, just like, oh, of course this makes sense, right? We are in the storytelling business, right? The sight, sound, and motion of video is such a storytelling first medium that, of course, it's going to resonate with the people that we want to buy one more ticket and come to our shows because we are storytelling and we're actually able to engage with them in storytelling. Right? So I want to give some examples of um, how digital is really starting to inform storytelling um, in, a, in a different way. So we have this, you know, the traditional story arc, and I'm not saying this doesn't work anymore. Like, this still, this still works, right? It's the reason why we, we go to shows, why we read something and we're moved by it. Um, but what we're finding now is there's this emerging story, story arc where you don't have this traditional lead in and build with this you know, beautiful climax and this sort of falling action. But you could really start high, you have subtle brand cues, unexpected ship. Like you could take people on a different journey than how we've been, since, since how storytelling has traditionally been, right? And 
I think this is a really exciting thing for us as creative folks, right? I think if you're like, you know, like Unilever, you're just like, oh great, I have to do something totally different now, I've been telling the same thing. But like we're creative folks, you're just like, oh my gosh, we could tell different kinds of stories? That's amazing. All of a sudden, you your creative canvas for what's possible becomes totally unique. So there are different ways where you could actually tell stories based off of, um, uh, based off of uh, the, these new emerging uh, uh, story arcs. Um, here's an example I wanted to walk through of, uh, again, this is another movie studio example, but I think what they did here is they created an entire creative ecosystem and sequential storytelling that's based off of how people were interacting with them uh, previously. So let's, let's roll this first video on the far, far left here. If you could dream something up, dare to dream anything, what would it be? We could actually pause it there. Yeah, so it looks like a movie trailer, right? There's nothing like super exciting about that. It looks like a regular movie trailer. But what is exciting is what they did next, The Greatest Showman, right? So for people who watched that first trailer on YouTube, what they then did to those folks who actually watched is they showed this top video. If we could roll a little bit of that one. What is your act, Mr. Carlisle? I don't have an act. Everyone's got an act. Can we pause that one? It's actually got this flipped. So the, the people who skipped, skipped the first one, saw that top one. So basically, uh, the, the thing to point out here is the first one is like Hugh Jackman is a star and he's there this whole thing. The second one, it's like Zendaya and Zac Efron. It might as well be a completely different movie, <laughs> right? It's like, it's like they, literally, they literally just cut a different trailer for people who skipped the first one to see if they could actually get them engaged with just a little different look, right? And they knew that because they knew these folks skipped the first ad, so they didn't give up on them. They're just like, ah, you know, they're, they're not, never gonna see this movie. They said, all right, what if we give them a little bit of a different look? Um, the people who actually watched, um, sorry for the confusion on the labels here, uh, they, they actually got this ad at the bottom. I'm putting together a show and I need a star. Uh, that's actually not the one that they saw. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, but, 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 that, but that's okay. I'm going to sort of reenact what they did here. Um, yeah, uh, so, so, so it, was, uh, it was actually what they got for people who saw that ad was a behind the scenes uh, video, right? So it was like Hugh Jackman and Zac Efron talking about just like, oh yeah, the training was so tough, and, but I made it. And like, you know, and, and then and like, and it, so it was this like bonus footage that was behind the scene where it looked totally different like from the, uh, it looked totally different from um, any of this, right? So you have the, the, main, the main trailer, people who skipped that trailer, got the Zac Efron Zendaya completely movie, you know, separate movie. Um, the people who, who actually watched, they then got this behind the scenes look of how the, of how the movie was made. I'm really excited to see like what this, <laughs> Like what this last one, oh yeah, here's the behind the scenes one. Okay, there you go, yeah. There you go. Day one. Day one, five, six, seven, eight. This was some of the most technical choreography I've ever attempted. Yeah, okay, you get, it. You get, you get the sense now. Yeah, yeah, there you go. So just a, just a little, you know, sort of. Uh, out of, you know, I was trying to really go for the flywheel cycle, right? Yeah, but it's, it's just like the engine wasn't quite right. Um, so, but the people who watched both of those, so the, the Zac Efron Zendaya creative plus the behind the scenes creative, everybody who watched then got this bottom one, right? And they got that weeks before the premiere. So they got the reminder that, hey, this movie's coming out in two weeks, you should buy your tickets, right? But the creative journey that they were on before that was completely informed by the intent that folks showed with how they watched that previous video. So again, this is the entire ecosystem uh, that was created, um, uh, entire ecosystem that was created based off of how people were engaging with videos along the sequence, right? 
And this is a super exciting thing for us to think as, as folks in the creative field. Um, so uh, another example here, I love this example because it's from Campbell's Soup, and if we can't beat Campbell's Soup, then like, we might as well give up, right? <laughs> like, what they did was is, uh, they targeted these six second ads, and you'll see just this dude here with a, you know, some Campbell's Soup with a super. Does your cooking make, does it dinner for one in front of the Beyonce video? Um, uh, well, I don't want to read that one. Um, <laughs> Uh, feeling more frozen than five years old music collection, right? And so dinner, dinner and epic fail. It's right. So it's like it was the same exact six second creative. It was just the super was changing, like for every single contextual signal. And so there are new tools that you could use on Google where you could you could do the same thing, where it's like we could figure out what are the t contextual signals that there are for you to uh, for you to target. Um, and all, all you need is literally the 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 same video spot could be the same, and it's just the super that changes, right? Um, and the incredible thing about this, too, is the, the reason this came about, this was for Campbell's Soup in Australia, and they're like in the middle of like the worst heat wave like ever, and like no one was buying soup. <laughs> and so they were just like, oh, what, can we do something different? And they did this, and you got this 24% lift in ad recall, and 5%, 55% lift in like literally like sodium water, right? right? It, it's like, <laughs> it's like it, if Campbell's Soup can do this, like, come on, like, what are we doing? Um, but, but I love the creativity here, though, right? And this, this isn't a heavy lift. It's just a six-second video with just a bunch of different supers based off of whatever the contextual content was going to be, right? So it's not the, the previous example. Like, that was a much larger ecosystem that they created. It was, you know, different longer spots for each particular moment. This is just a six-second spot with a different super that was sort of scaled out across... Um, a whole bunch of different content, right? Think of how delightful th that would be to, to get that experience, right? That super contextual relevant experience. Um, so uh, I talked about, we talked about targeting in, in media earlier. So um, this is from Nielsen. So targeting in media impacts about 9% of the purchase decision. Creative impacts 47% of the purchase decision. So creative really matters, but again, that should be really exciting for us because we are actually in the creative field, right? Storytelling is our product. It's at our fingertips. It's who we are, right? Do what you do best. Tell compelling stories with digital insight. So I want to close things out uh, going back to the art, uh, art's heart uh, again. So entertainment is a gift. Um, what do I mean by this? Uh, we are not selling shoes or insurance or toothpaste. Um, we are not a commodity. Um, we are inviting people into an artistic experience that is literally at the top of like Maslow's pyramid, right? Self-actualization. 82% of people in the US agree without entertainment in my life, I wouldn't be me. Like we talked about just the joy that gets sparked earlier by entertainment. We're talking about what drives meaning in people's lives here. And I've been talking a lot about the casual fan today, how do we get, how do we get this group to buy one more ticket. Um, through all of this, I've actually been talking about myself. Um, I used to be a frequent live event goer. I used to go to shows left and right. But what happened to me? <laughs> this happened to me, right? I've been chasing my son around for the past year, right? So time has completely shifted in my, in me following this guy, right? This was, this was, uh, he got cold feet, or, or I guess um, cold hands and knees in this case, um, <laughs> when he was a flower boy at a friend's wedding. He only made it about halfway down the, halfway down the aisle. Um, he's, uh, he's actually much happier when he's in a ball pit, um, or, or better yet, a, a mud puddle. Um, yeah, at this uh, super hippie daycare we send him. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, the fact, though, that I am a father doesn't diminish the fact that I have a deep passion for the performing arts. And I still, you know, my live event, you know, entertainment is different, but I, my passion still lies with you, right? If you could get me to just one more event this year, it's not only good for you, it's good for me. It's what I love, right? 
And just to give you a sense of like the full perspective of performing arts of who I am, like I love telling stories at the moth, right? You saw, you, so this is from last year, sneak peek, right? So, so I was Peter Pan and Peter Pan back in middle school. So is Karina here again today? She was, she was Wendy in middle school? Yeah, and so, yeah, I feel like this is incredible. Actually, next year we're gonna do, uh, perform for you all. Yeah, maybe, maybe we can get some suggestions. Should it be, I won't grow up, I got a crow, like, you, you know, crowd, crowd choice here. Um, Eric was also talking about like how hard it is or how he thinks constantly about getting people to speak here. I think his first interview question should be, were you in Peter Pan in middle school? <laughs> if the answer is yes, he's just like, great, you're, you're in. Um, uh, and then of course there's the Tableau Vivant, right? So it's like performing arts is a part of my life experience now, in the past, and will be going forward. But just because I have a son now doesn't mean this is all gone, right? I would love to go to one more event, right? And so. What I'm asking you isn't, um, what I'm asking you is, is to do something that is in your DNA, right? Creativity is your every day. You don't have to make up stories to move your patrons like Campbell's Soup did, right? You are the stories. And with partners like Capacity and with the insights from this research, you don't really have to interrupt your patrons either. You could understand how they are living their lives engaged with you online. So when I urge you to unleash the creative potential that's innate in all of you, I'm just asking you to be yourself, right? And when you could be yourself, that allows me, as the person going to one more event, to be my full self too, right? That's at the core of what we're doing. So to recap what we talked about, um, so understanding the, the in-market casual fan, a couple highlights here. So they spend a week longer in consideration. Does your marketing strategy match their consideration time frame? They visit your performance sites more than frequent purchasers. Are you optimizing your sites accordingly? There's one takeaway from bootcamp, I think, thinking about site optimization is, is really tops on that list. There is not one set path to ticket purchase, but there is a relevant audience of ticket seekers across platforms. How are you engaging relevant audience as opposed to platform? Using intent to drive consideration. Ticket considerers spend more time searching on general interest terms. What are you doing to get them clo closer to purchase? These are the, the hamlets, remember? Performing arts ticket considerers are more likely to be average fans and are planning for family experiences. How are you appealing to their unique needs? Search is not the only intent-based platform. How are you using other intent signals to get them further down that consideration path? So let digital deepen storytelling. YouTube and video is more impactful along the path to purchase for performing arts patrons than any other live event attendee. That's an incredible strength that we have. What digital signals are you using to inform the storytelling you're sharing with your patrons? And then lastly, how can you use sequential storytelling or sequential or contextual signals to move your patrons? So just some questions to consider. But ultimately, it's going back to what I said before. Here's my, my last haiku. It's by being yourself, you help me be my full self. It's your art and, and my passion. Um, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> And I have some, I have some time to, to answer some questions, I believe. Thank you. Um, this is really just out of curiosity, but do you guys find that subscription services to movie theaters like MoviePass are um, starting to collect data on movie theater ticket buyers for the first time ever? I'm sure they are, yeah. um, but I think they have other problems with their business model. <laughs> I um, know. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, they, they have to be. Right. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All 
I should have had more baby pictures, I, I guess. <laughs> oh, yeah, here we go, right in the front. Was there any, um, in your survey, did you ask casual fans if there were barriers for getting them to that one extra performance? No, it real, it, there, that's a really good question. It was, there was no direct question like that. Um, but from the research, we're saying like, okay, they are, they're more average fans. They're, they're deciding for, for people, not just themselves. They have that family impact. So there wasn't the question of like, what would it take? Um, but more of sort of observationally, um, what would it be? There wasn't that direct question. Um, but I do think that, um, yeah, it's, it's a good one. And I, wonder, and I bet you it would align. I wonder if we were getting really deep, if we had this sort of, you know, hour and 20 minutes pizza and beer like Aubrey, where we could really get into it. I would have loved that as a, as a, as a follow-up. Yeah. Hi there. Um, with respect to the purchase consideration window, is there any deeper dive data out there as far as the efficacy? You mentioned kind of that hypothetical situation in which someone says to start a campaign like five days before the event. Um, is there anything that we can look at to kind of understand how much the efficacy of a campaign might degrade if we shrink that window or expand that window kind of where that lands a patron? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think one of the one area that I find folks are um, leaning into a little bit more is reach. So it's understanding what that qualified audience is and then saying, all right, what percent of that audience do we want to reach over that um, given amount of time? Um, so reach is one of those metrics, but it also is really dependent on sort of the context around it as well. It's like, website traffic could be really important further out as opposed to ticket purchase. So it's like we have to, we have to cater what we're tracking um, along the way to make sure it's actually relevant to what the mindset of that uh, considerer may be. Hey, look, yeah. it's Kristen. That was great. Thank you. Um, I'm curious if the reserve with Google, that purchase button that is possible from the search result page, if that intersects here, like how you guys, if you were thinking about that, and like if, if people didn't leave search to purchase, does that, does that impact anything? Yeah, so the, the, what search is trying to do, like at its core, is really just trying to get you as quickly to whatever is gonna be most relevant based on that seed of curiosity that you just plugged into search. So um, it, it actually wants you to spend as little time on search as possible and get you to the most relevant place to be. Um, so, I don't necessarily see the sort of search product changing in a way that would get more folks to buy on search itself, but something that facilitates the ease of purchase when you click uh, on search is that experience that you're driving people to, particularly on a mobile device, um, that seamless um, ex high expectation, um, going to meet those high expectations that, that people have when, the, when they get there. So I'd say the, the medium of search is really trying to get you to wherever you want to be as quickly as possible, to that information as quickly as possible. And then it's sort of on that, the, the site experience at that point to facilitate that, that purchase as, as fast as possible. Yeah. yeah. If, if I can just make a comment. Um, many years ago, the Broadway Theater League did a psychographic segmentation study of New York theater goers. And this group that you call the casual theater goer, they called entertainment seekers. They were generally less informed, which would align with why it takes them longer to make a decision. Yeah. Yeah. And they treated it, you mentioned families, they treated it as a special occasion, a special night out. They would get dressed up, they would go to dinner, uh, so they would have to plan for all this. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the messaging, it's, it's a kind of different angle than the people who go all the time. Right. It's part of their life. They don't even think about it as right. something right. different. So some of the qualitative information could maybe be helpful there. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you for that. And I think that's a nice rounding out of, of, of that perspective as well, for sure. How do we match the, um, what our patrons or what, what our fans are, are looking for to their unique needs? Absolutely. Tableau Vivant ideas? Anybody just get them out? Just get them, just get them out here. Oh, yeah. oh, a Tableau Vivant idea. No. 
for your whole presentation, I've been wanting to say, to thine own self be true. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, I can't take any other questions after that. So, <laughs> yeah. so thank you very much. <laughs>